Welcome to NTWC Live. My name is Alex Garcia. I'm the director of the National Tropical Weather Conference. These programs are made possible by USAA, South Padre Island Convention and Visitors Bureau, and Plylox Hurricane Clips. To produce these programs, it's a team effort. We have Bill Reed and Tim Smith with us this morning. Here's Tim Smith. Good morning, everybody. Glad to see you all online with us this morning for NTWC Live. We've got a great program for you today. Um, our guy who just disappeared for a while last year and then managed to come back. So you'll hear from Josh Morgan in just a few minutes. We are excited uh, to be doing these programs. Uh, this is the uh, first one this week. We've got another one tomorrow uh, with Dr. Phil Klosbach as he updates his hurricane seasonal forecast. As Alex mentioned, we couldn't do it without our sponsor, South Pottery Island, USAA. Plylox, the Hurricane Clips folks, uh, they may be being purchased up in a big way right now in, uh, in parts of the Gulf Coast. So uh, the dramatic music in the background, let's throw it over to Bill Reed, who comes to us today from Houston. Bill. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks for being with us again. Uh, tropics are active. Uh, we had a land, we've had two landfalls this morning, one in India, south of Mumbai, Tropical Cyclone Sarga. Josh informed me there was a Category 1 at landfall. And of more interest to us is what's happening with uh, Crystal Ball. And if I do this right, I'll be able to show you the radar as it's made landfall. And here we go. And here we go. Uh, this is a, a, a radar that's been very useful to, on this storm, uh, Saban Kui radar, which is uh, on the uh, uh, Bay of Campeche coast, uh, uh, just to the east of where the... Uh, sorry about that. My phone went off on me there. The uh, uh, system made landfall just to the west of Ciudad del Carmen this morning. And as you can see there, it had this it strong rain band. It's had big rain band over the Yucatan, western Yucatan, has been reforming and firing over that area each night for the last three days. So incredible rainfall totals uh, have been occurring throughout the area. And the flooding and the loss of life from that will be the, the main story we uh, hear about uh, from that. Uh, hopefully, we've gotten a uh, a uh, update. Yeah, there we go. Uh the latest forecast uh, now with, with increasing confidence, but still some uncertainty as to the track. Uh, the models have been fo focused on the Louisiana coastline uh, 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 for several days now. And as you can see, the official forecast uh, keeps it a tropical storm and brings it inland uh, to south central Louisiana. Uh, so uh, start paying attention to it. Uh, uh, the intensity forecast is still a bit uncertain, but uh, hopefully it'll stay in the tropical storm mode and hopefully it'll keep on moving so we don't have the flooding issues that they're seeing down in uh, South and Central America. Okay, uh, what you really are here to see is what we're going to do with uh, uh, Josh this year on the uh, on the thing. And, and he hit the jackpot last year with, with uh, Dorian out in the Bahamas. Uh, he tells me he's been on the made uh, landfalls just about every continent that has them and he still needs to get India and he probably would have made that mark this year if it hadn't have been for uh, the COVID issues. So Josh, take it away. Hey, thanks Bill. Thanks Alex. Thanks Tim. It's, uh, it's awesome to be back with you guys. I'm sorry we couldn't uh, do it in person this year. I was really, I always look forward to my, to my April on South Padre Island, Texas, and uh, I'm looking forward to that again next year, but uh, this is awesome as well. I'm very excited to be able to present my experience of Hurricane Dorian. So let me, uh, let me bring that up. Alrighty, so my presentation is on Dorian from ground zero, measuring and surviving the storm of the century. And that might sound like hyperbole, but it is not. It is, I will, I will support that statement in just a second. So just to refresh everyone's memory, of course, most of the people watching this presentation are very familiar with Dorian. It was the big headline last year. And you can see here's the bird's eye view or the, the big picture view of its life cycle. Started out as a wave in the middle of the Atlantic, moved west, clipped the Caribbean. Uh, then when it got out into the open Atlantic, it exploded into a really intense hurricane, smashed the Bahamas in maximum intensity. And then 
very quickly cut north, missed Florida, clipped the Carolinas, and then unraveled over the Canadian Maritimes. And here's sort of the fact sheet on the storm. And you can see uh, the dates for this thing. It was basically the um, right at the climatological peak of the season, maybe just right before, but the timing of it made sense. Uh, the peak intensity was a whopping 160 knots or 185 miles an hour, making this thing one of the real legends of the Atlantic. And you can see that a lot of people felt the wrath of this thing. Uh, just uh, a lot of land masses got stricken by it when it was at hurricane force. Now, for the purposes of this presentation, what I'm specifically interested in is the landfall on Great Abaco Island in the Bahamas when it hit at 160 knots. Now that's really significant because when you look at history, you could see where Dorian Falls. This is the list of all known Category 5 hurricane landfalls in North America uh, as far back as records go, which is the middle of the 19th century. And you can see that if you rank them by wind speed, Dorian is at the top, at the very top, tied with the Labor Day hurricane of 1935 in Florida, both of which had estimated winds of 160 knots or 185 miles an hour at landfall. And when you see it put like this, you can see how serious this storm was and why I called the storm of the century. And here it is at that dramatic moment as it was coming ashore on Great Abaco Island. You can see that beautifully formed eye and just that intense looking core. Now, very fortunately, I was there to document this historic event. In fact, that star represents where I was. And that's, of course, when I was inside the eye. So probably a lot of people watching this presentation know who I am, but just in case you don't, let me give you some really quick background on me. Uh, I'm a hurricane chaser, uh, and very specifically a hurricane chaser. Folks always ask me, hey, do you, do you chase uh, tornadoes or snowstorms? No, I do not. I am very not versatile. I'm, uh, I'm narrowly obsessed with hurricanes, and I've been chasing them for almost 30 years. Uh, my first chase, I was too young to even... Uh, rent a car to, to drive after the storm so i i chased it by train and this was <laughs> this was before the internet even so uh, back then it was paper maps and things like that i chase around the world every hemisphere uh, i chase very aggressively i'm competitive about it i treat it like a sport and also i do not have any formal meteorological credentials uh, i'm very very good at collecting accurate quality controlled field data that's what i do but no i am technically not a scientist I'm very obsessive about what I do. Here's my portfolio of chases. This is the 49 hurricanes and typhoons in which I penetrated at least the eye wall. For me, if I don't get in the eye wall, it doesn't count. It's considered a bust. Uh, so these are the 49 eye wall scores that I've had. I'm wondering where 50, uh, when and where 50 is going to be. I thought maybe it might be crystal ball uh, in Texas or Louisiana this week, but uh, not feeling so, so sure about that this morning, but uh, we'll see. So my chasing, people ask me, well, why do you chase? Why do you do this? Definitely, I think the initial itch was definitely uh, some kind of thrill-seeking thing, you know, just uh, just getting that adrenaline rush from hurricanes that I do every time. And that's still motivating. But for me, the big thing now, the thing that really gets me excited and drives me is what I call truth-seeking. So it started for me about 10 years ago. You know, there were a couple of big typhoon landfalls in the Philippines. Now, the Philippines, in case you don't know, you know, the, the the U.S. states of like Oklahoma and Kansas are probably like the tornado capital of the world. Well, when it comes to hurricanes, it's the Philippines. Of course, over there, they're called typhoons. But the Philippines is the world capital. They get Category 5 landfalls like a, a couple of times a decade at least. And there were a couple of big ones about 10 years ago. And there were no meteorological records of these events as they came ashore, nothing. No, no recon data, no ground stations, nothing. All we knew about these storms were what we could kind of glean from satellite intensity estimates. And I found that really frustrating that these incredible landfall events were not being recorded. And then I realized, hey, you know, I can make a difference because I'm hunting these things down anyway, uh, often in remote areas. And so that is my big driving passion now is to just get inside the cores of these cyclones coming ashore in remote areas. Now, because I'm just hopping all over the world and sometimes jumping between islands, you know, on little tiny planes and stuff, I got to be super portable. You know, I don't have any like big van tricked out with equipment and stuff like that. Everything's got to be small and easy to carry around. So uh, the things that I, I shoot to measure are air pressure um, and take, and then I also take very, uh, meticulous video that's all time stamped. I keep track of my location at all times. And just with those bits of data, 
quality, accurately recorded data. I can make all kinds of inferences afterward about the hurricane's uh, size, its structure, and other things about it. And it's not just for me. Scientists actually use my data. The National Hurricane Center uses my data. PhDs use my data. My data become very useful oftentimes as like sort of the missing puzzle piece when they're doing post-analysis on storms. I think of myself as kind of like the hunting dog for scientists. So I'm not the scientist, but I'm hunting down the data for them. And what am I hunting exactly? Well, like I said, I'm going after the core of the hurricane, that inner part, because that's where all the really meaningful data is. In a lot of, uh, or in a few recent storms, uh, my data were basically the only data at landfall. And a good recent example would be Hurricane Willa in Mexico. There were basically no observations from the core of that, except for the sensors that I, I put uh, at various points in the landfall region. And from those data, the Hurricane Center was able to kind of reconstruct what happened and it made their report more complete. And that was awesome. I felt really good about that. All right. Skip that to me. So let's get back to Dorian. And I thought I'd bring you along on the chase. I think uh, a lot of folks don't realize how complicated chasing is and how uh, how <laughs> emotional the process is. So I thought I'd bring you through uh, the sort of the decision-making process step by step so you can see what it's like. So again, here's the big picture track of Dorian from its birth in the tropics to its unraveling, its demise over Canada. And if we zoom in close, you can see this is a significant part of its life cycle. So Dorian was first named, I think on, it was 24th of August. I was in New York at the time. And my initial instinct was that I was gonna chase it in the Dominican Republic. And so I booked a flight to Santo Domingo and I thought, okay, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna catch this thing as a hurricane on the South coast of the Dominican Republic, cool. And I very quickly canceled that plan and instead decided to go to Punta Cana, which is uh, at the very Eastern tip of the Dominican Republic. And that was my plan and I was ready to go but as this thing entered the Caribbean, it never really, never really got going. And I, of course, as a lot of people know, that's climatologically pretty normal. Eastern Caribbean is often fairly unfriendly to tropical cyclones. So I canceled that plan and just decided to wait until this thing got out of the Caribbean. Sure enough, uh, cut two days later, it's out in the open Atlantic. It's a monster hurricane. And all the computer models are saying that this is going to ram the east coast of Florida as an intense hurricane. So I flew down to Orlando. And by the way, that's an MO of mine. I never fly into coastal airports. I always fly into inland airports and then drive to where I want to be. That's a little chaser dude rule of mine. And then from there, I drove to West Palm Beach and I slept overnight. And then I noticed, of course, that the computer models were changing again. They started to show the hurricane and not hitting Florida, but actually stalling just offshore. And then they started to show it making a very quick U-turn or not a U-turn, but a really sharp turn off of Florida. And it was at that point that I realized that if I wanted to taste this historic storm, if I wanted to sample it, if I wanted to measure it, if I wanted to get inside of it, I had to get off the Florida Peninsula and head it to the Bahamas, specifically to Great Abaco Island. And that's what I did. And here's my plane ticket. I kind of saved it because it, it has significance to me. This was the last flight onto Great Abaco Island uh, to the airport in Marsh Harbor. Uh, and uh, after that, once we landed, it was the day before the hurricane, the uh, airport closed down and that was that. And the airport did not open for a very, very long time afterward. And you'll see why in just a moment. Now, in case you're wondering, Marsh Harbor is sort of like, it's sort of like the de facto capital of Great Abaco Island. It's a town of about 6,000 people. It's the commercial and administrative hub for the island. And I like to show this view so you could see the Bahamas are, you know, it's a separate country. You know, we think of it as far away, but look how close it is. You know, that flight from West Palm Beach to Marsh Harbor is really, God, it's probably like 40 minutes. I mean, it's nothing. You just, you pop right over there. You're practically in Florida. So I landed in Marsh Harbor, and then from there I drove north to a place called Treasure Key. That's about a 20-mile drive there, what you're looking at. And I had a place staked out uh, where you could see the red circle. And here's a dramatic selfie that I took when I arrived there. And this is where I was going to ride out the hurricane. Now, at this point, Dorian was a Category 4, so it was a serious hurricane. Not yet at the kind of historic level, but it was definitely a serious hurricane heading toward me. And I thought, okay, these condos are sturdy. This is going to be an incredible front row seat to this hurricane. I'm going to get incredible video. I'm going, to, I'm going to capture incredible data. This is going to be like, wow, this is going to be amazing, this location. And here's the other side of the, that bank of condos, what they look like. These are three-story buildings made mostly of concrete, but not entirely. And uh, this is a final shot I took as the sun was going down. This is the 
This is the night before Dorian struck this island. And I, I always look at this picture because it, it shows you the beauty of uh, Great Abaco Island. And just you can imagine the lifestyle of just living there, how idyllic and how pretty it is. And just like it's so serene. And uh, it kind of breaks my heart looking at this because that was kind of the that that was the last night of paradise for this place for a very long time to come. And when I say very long, I'm talking like over a decade, probably because of the the impact that happened here. So I tried, I forced myself to go to go to sleep for a couple hours. That's uh, something I've been trying to be get better about is getting some sleep when I'm on chases. So I'm not just going, 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 because usually by the time the hurricane strikes, I'm exhausted and I'm just running totally on adrenaline, which is not healthy. I woke up in the middle of the night or actually in the wee morning hours and I started to hear the wind howling and it was just, you know, I've been in a lot of hurricanes, but there's something about the howl that started to creep me out. I started to get like a, a spooked kind of feeling, which I usually don't get. You guys know I'm like rabid about chasing hurricanes. But something about it made me uneasy. And I remember I was laying in bed and I went on my phone and I started looking at the recon data. They were doing a recon flight in the storm and it started showing category five winds. Something was happening in the storm. It looked like it was uh, kind of having some sort of upswing. And I was like, oh boy. And I started thinking about it and I'm like, you know what? I don't think that this is a good place to ride out the storm. I just started feeling like I was playing games with my life. So late that night or probably around three or four in the morning, I packed the car and I drove back down to Marsh Harbor. And it was a it was a dark, lonely drive, but I just felt like, you know what, this is what this is what I have to do to be safe. I'm a very aggressive chaser, but I've got a I've got to, you know, I need to make sure I survive these events. So there were actually two reasons I went back down um, to Marsh Harbor. One was, as I said, I didn't quite feel safe in that location in Treasure Key. But the other reason was that the storm was moving due west at this point, And it was very, very important to me to get in Dorian's eye. I didn't want to just get in the eye wall. I wanted to get in that eye. It was extremely important to me. And I didn't want to miss that. So I figured I should go back down south. And that's what I did. Now, if we zoom in on the storm's track, these are the hourly positions as the storm uh, passed over Great Abaco and then Grand Bahama Islands. And you can see the star that's marked I Cyclone. That's where I was. And you can see I nailed it pretty good, uh, my final location. Here's a zoomed in look and you can see, yeah, that 2 p.m. location is basically, that 2 p.m. position of the Hurricane Center is that's basically right on top of me. And a very, very close view, you can see I actually had two locations during the storm. Position A was where I was at the beginning of the storm and then during the eye, I had to relocate because of damage to the building. I'll talk about that in a little while. Uh, B is where I relocated to and the distance between those two points is about, <coughs> excuse me, two thirds of a mile. All right, so now let's go through the impact and what I measured and what I saw. So when I got back to Marsh Harbor, I was like, all right, this hurricane is looking really strong. There's two things I need to I need to figure out. I need to find a building that's strong, like i.e. concrete, and two that's elevated, that's that's high enough that I'm not going to get hit by the storm surge. So there's a hilly part, there's a hilly neighborhood of Marsh Harbor, and I drove around it until I found a big concrete looking building, which was the Central Abaco Primary School. And sure enough, it was open as a shelter. I generally don't like to go use uh, hurricane shelters as places to ride out storms because it cuts down on your autonomy a little bit but uh it seemed like the right bet and so that's where i decided to ride at this storm at this primary school with probably a couple hundred other people and uh take a look at the outside of the uh building this is like the parking lot take a look at those trees remember what they look like because it's going to be radically transformed in just a little while all right so once I got there, I set up. I set up with two barometers. I always try to have at least two instruments going so I have some data redundancy. So if I get really, really wild readings, I'll have another instrument to corroborate. So I went down to this uh, this shore, which was not too far away, and um, I, I uh, got sea level pressure. And then I used the devices as uh, pressure altimeters to then figure out my elevation at the school so I could then uh, calibrate for sea level pressure. And then I also had a couple of cameras going. And with those tools, I recorded this event. Now, recording or documenting Dorian was challenging. Documenting storms that are so violent like this uh, make it hard to do good documentation. But even so, I was able to get what I needed to get to infer all kinds of things about this storm. All right, so one of the first things I do when I come back after a hurricane is I like to reconstruct 
a very detailed chronology of what happened. Okay, so what I do is I go through my video footage minute by minute. It's all very precisely timestamped. And I go through my pressure data and I then create sort of a log of what happened. And then the next thing I do is I try to sort of identify the phases of the hurricane and I color code those. So with this, you could see you don't have to read all this, don't worry, but just to give you a general idea, Pink means we're getting into the eye wall. Red means we're in what seem to be the peak winds. Blue is when we're in the calm eye. Now these are, I was not measuring wind data, so these are subjectively assigned phases. Uh, and that means they're not exactly precise, but I think they give, they, they help in terms of giving a good idea of the duration of the event and also the size of the hurricane and things like that. And you'll see, I'm gonna show you video clips of certain parts of this chronology and you'll see that it's pretty easy to identify these phases you could see them even though they're subjectively assigned here's another look at the same information and the same data but here visualized um, as a graph and you can see as the pressure fall we go into the pink which is the eye wall and then the dark pink which is the peak winds and then the blue of the uh, which is the calm eye and you can see that the duration of that really really bad part was about an hour and a half i measured 913.4 millibars in the eye which is by, by far the lowest i've recorded in any chase uh, and uh, i'll talk more about that in just a moment so now what i want to do is bring you through the experience i want to bring you through specific moments of this event, because I think it was quite fascinating just being the strongest hurricane ever to hit North America. All right, so back at our chronology, first what I wanna show you is the outer eye wall, okay? And I wanna be clear, I'm not suggesting, this storm did not have concentric eye walls, it had one consolidated eye wall. What I'm talking about is what it was like just as we started to enter the outer part of that one eye wall. And just to give you a little visual help here, here's the radar. And you can see, okay, this storm has a single consolidated eye wall. And that star is where I was. That's Marsh Harbor. And you can see this video clip is just as we were just getting into that eye wall. And you can see we're already getting very destructive winds, but we're nowhere near the really bad stuff yet. So let's take a look at that. Just before noon, and we're at 960 millibars. The wind is ripping really hard, but the scary thing is we have like another almost 40 millibars to lose. We have a lot of ice wars to go through, a lot of gradients. I think the wind's going to get worse. Wow. All right, so that's just a small, oops, sorry about that. A little, there we go. So that's just a small taste of what's to come. Now, by the way, I wanted to give you a little more detail about where I was. So once the storm really started to hit, the, uh, the military dudes that were watching the uh, shelter just made everyone, everyone had to get in classrooms. And one, you know, rule number one when you're chasing is don't be a nuisance and don't argue with authorities. You must do as instructed because the last thing you wanna do is be some person from out of town who's getting in the way and disobeying rules. So my choices were to hunker down in a classroom or ride the storm out in my car in the parking lot, which would be a really, really bad idea in a 185 mile an hour wind. So I chose to be in a classroom and I was in a, so it was a, it was just a simple four wall concrete classroom with exterior walls on all sides. Uh, the school was actually a complex of very small buildings. Uh, and I was with two families and three other men. So there were 11 of us. And there were windows on the upwind side of the room and windows on the downwind side. The windows, and this is all, this will, I'm giving you all this information so you can understand what's happening in the video. The windows on the upwind side, meaning they were facing the wind, were boarded up and had cyclone shutters on them. The windows on the downwind side, we could actually open the cyclone shutters and look through the cracks. And that's how, that's all the, the filming that I'm doing during uh, sort of the brunt of the hurricane is is through that view, through the downwind side of the windows. And that's what we're looking at. And we're looking out toward the front, uh, we're, we're looking out from the front of the building into the parking lot. And you can see there's cars parked near us that are getting hammered pretty good, but they're actually slightly protected by the building that we're in. All right, 
So now that I gave you that orientation, now what I want to show you is the transition from being in the eye wall to being in what the inner eye wall when stuff starts to get really nuts, when we start to get those really crazy turbulent gusts and everything, we start to get into something of a whiteout and you can see it really starting to crank. Now, one thing you're going to notice in this uh, in this next segment is everyone in the room is rubbing their ears. It's, it's killing everyone's ears. Now, people think that that's because the pressure in a hurricane is low. It's actually, that's not what causes that. When your ears hurt during a hurricane, it's because you're in a very turbulent part of it and you're getting extreme wind gusts passing over the building, which are causing temporary uh, pressure fluctuations and that that's what your ears are feeling. And we were getting such violent gusts that that's what was causing it. And it is really painful. You feel like your eardrums are going to totally bust. So here we go. Let's take a look at that. Oh, actually, I forgot. I wanted to do some science nerd out on you before I show you the video. you got to eat your vegetables first. <laughs> um this is actually really fascinating. Okay, so this is a close-up view of the data that I showed you before, but this is a close-up view of just the, the core of the hurricane. Now, notice something really interesting. The video I just showed you was, was from the light pink part, which was, okay, we're in the eye wall, but we're not in the inner part of it yet. Notice that in that part, the pressure is dropping fairly in a fairly sort of behaved, uh, steady way. Now, as we get into the inner part of the eye wall, where we get into what seem to be the peak winds and the maximum turbulence, notice how the pressure starts to get really, it fluctuates kind of wildly, that the line is more jagged. There's like these up and down fluctuations. That is a good indicator of what the, in, the inner core of a violent hurricane is like. There's a lot of turbulence in that inner eye wall. There are like all kinds of localized disturbances and eddies and maybe some mesovortices vortices going on in that. And even, when, even though you can't see these things happening, you you can, you can see them in the pressure trace afterward. The pressure trace is like almost like taking an x-ray. It shows you things that are happening that you maybe can't see because everything outside is just turning white. So what I'm going to show you in this next video is as we transition from the light pink to the dark pink, we're going into like the, the kind of really extreme part of the hurricane. All right, so let's take care. Okay, so you, you digested your science part. Now you can have the dessert. Okay, here's the video for that. See the cars bobbing up and down. Well, the cars are, are like picking up. All right. So by that point, by that point, we were uh, we were getting full on raked. All right. So then the, the hurricane slowly crept over us, and then we were in that inner, inner part of the eye wall. And I found this in violent hurricanes, that the worst part of the hurricane, when it gets especially violent, is actually, it literally is almost, it, it's right at that boundary between the eye wall and the eye. It, it's very interesting. In fact, I've noticed it in many hurricanes that some of the most violent gusts they almost happen right as you're entering the eye. It's like the final, final gasp from the eye wall is sometimes like the worst part of it. So now I'm going to show you video from that part. So this was always, this was like my, as a chaser and as a hurricane nerd, this is like my lifelong fantasy. It's like, okay, I want to be in a like, like high end category five hurricane on a tropical island or technically subtropical, but you know what I mean? 
with you know flat terrain nothing to interfere with the wind flow and it's daytime it's like optimal conditions to record this event and i was like wow this is perfect but it actually wasn't what i expected and the, and what i mean by that is that you <laughs> you couldn't see anything okay so i'm going to show you now in the chronology i'm going to show you when we're deep deep in that eye wall and how basically the conditions got so turbulent and crazy. In fact, one of the specialists at the hurricane center looked at the video and he's like, it was like it, your, your video actually would have been better if the hurricane weren't as bad because you'd be able to see something. <laughs> so everything just kind of turns white, but I want to give you a, an idea about that. And what's really interesting is that a lot of the really extreme destruction and some of the weird stuff, like for example, cars in front of the window, just blowing away. A lot of that happened behind this sort of curtain of white that just kind of happened for about 30 minutes. But let me show you a little piece of that just so you could see what it was like not to see anything. You can occasionally see debris flying by. Those are the upwind windows, which we're worried about caving in. Alrighty, yeah. So we were just getting, we were getting, uh, we were getting full on raked there. So I couldn't see what was going on, but the barometers could, and they were recording some incredible things. So when I went back over the data afterward, it was the data from this part of the event that most blew my mind and was like, whoa. So the data showed some really incredible air pressure drops over very short periods of time. And they suggest that there were some very, very extreme pressure gradients in the inner core of this thing. So Dorian was moving steadily west at six knots or six nautical miles an hour as it passed over my location as I went right through it. Okay, so therefore you can assume that the devices that were at my location and that were recording data in that room sampled one nautical mile of the cyclone every 10 minutes and therefore I could take pressure changes over 10 minute periods and therefore understand those to basically indicate the gradients over one nautical mile samples of the cyclone. And what I got when I did that, when I went through the data was I found many examples of gradients well over 10 millibars a nautical mile and some much higher. And that is, that is nuts. Um, now, of course, these are rough calculations and they don't take into account smaller scale features within, within the system. And I and granted they're, they're rough, but they still give you an idea of just the incredible sort of, uh, just the incredible gradients in that inner core. And let me show you some of the maximum ones. So this is a the same data, but we're zoomed in even closer on the inner, inner eye wall. And you can see uh, the values that I calculated, the peak gradient that I got was 12.4 millibars per nautical miles, which is just, that's like, yeah, that's like off the charts. That's really crazy. And it was during that very sort of jagged period when the pressure was fluctuating wildly up and down. And I do this for all the major hurricanes I'm in, and I wanted to show you how Dorian uh, compared to some of the other crazy ones that I've been in. And you could see Dorian totally kicks butt, just just blows all the other ones out of the water. On uh, second place is Hurricane Patricia in Mexico. Now, Patricia was the strongest hurricane ever observed on Earth. It's estimated uh, sustained winds of 185 knots or 215 miles an hour. It weakened before it got to me on the coast, but it still had a really intense core there, 10.5 millibars per nautical mile. Michael in the Florida Panhandle was also pretty high. Maria as well. Those are some of the legends in terms of gradients that I calculated, but nothing like Durian. I mean, Durian was just like, it knocked all the other ones out of the water. And that was really something to see. All right, so now 
I want to bring you to one of those magical parts of a hurricane, which is as you transition from the inner eye wall into the eye, which I always, it's always just kind of a very, for me, it's almost like a religious experience. All right, so here it is on the chronology, transitioning from the red, the peak winds, to the eye. And here's what it was like. Now, you'll notice um, in part of this video, uh, my uh, someone in the room took my phone for part of this, and she filmed a couple of shots while I was busy uh, trying to keep the, the windows from caving in. The upwind, uh, the windows on the upwind side of the room, uh, the board started to rip off, and uh, the, the shutters started to, to bend inward. We were very concerned because if those wind, if those shutters gave, the room was going to become a shooting gallery of flying debris. And in fact, I remember at the time thinking we were very unlucky, and as it turned out, we were the luckiest of anyone in the entire school because other classrooms. In the, on the complex had blown open and people were, you know, just having to dive under furniture, you know, in a category five hurricane with the roof gone. I mean, it was, it was an ugly scene all around. So we were pretty lucky, but here you can see, watch it. And one other thing to look at in this clip, notice while we're holding the furniture against the shutters that it starts to kind of get bright and there's actually sunshine, even though the wind is roaring and it's probably blowing at 130 knots, there's sunshine coming through the slats in the, the cracks in the shutters. We were getting so close to the eye that we were actually getting sunshine, even though we were in winds well over hurricane force. It was one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. So check it out. The boards blew up the windows to try to keep them out, keep out the wind. Seven, sky is brightening. Pressure is like it's been fluctuating between like nine, fourteen, and nine eighteen millibars. I think I think we're almost in the eye. Oh my god, I think we're almost in the eye. is just thrown over, all over the parking lot, like every which way. Wow. All right. And uh, I took this still from my video. This is kind of a magical moment. It almost has like a religious look. This is as the sunshine was coming through the, the, the window slats and everyone was just looking out, you know, as the eye was passing over us. And here's the radar shot from this time. And uh, yeah, you know, this was like a bullseye, you know, just nailed this one real good right in the middle. And it's a, that's a, you know, as, as a lot of the folks watching this presentation know, that's a, that's a, a from a, hurricane standpoint this is a beautiful specimen just the, the way this eye wall is formed i mean this is really i won't see something like this again in my lifetime i don't think all right so now what i want to do is bring you through the eye okay um and this is a longer clip because i just want you to experience it as i experienced it as i went outside so the door was was wedged shut we couldn't open it because debris had slammed against it and dented it we had to kind of force it open and uh the video starts from when we forced the door open and just just um you know you're gonna come on a walk with me and you're gonna see what this place looks like after it got hammered by a 160 knot eye wall Notice the car is just thrown all over the place. They were obviously not parked that way. A lot of concrete is smashed.
And here's the stadium eye. Alrighty, so uh, it was, there's something really apocalyptic about that. I just remember being like, whoa, here's a still of that stadium eye you could see. It was a little, it was getting a little misty because the, uh, the hurricane was interacting with land, but you could very clearly see that that shape, that perfect shape of that eye wall. It was really, it was quite gorgeous. Uh, notice that the cars were mutilated. Like the, I've never seen this after a hurricane, where like like the, like the the trunks and hoods were just like ripped open, and the engines inside were mangled. Just like crazy looking stuff I'd like never seen in a hurricane before. It was like really like whoa. Um, you could see a lot of concrete uh, parts of the, even though the building was concrete or blocks, it was uh, it was just like in a lot of places just smashed and like ripped open. Parts of the building that were not concrete were just no match for this hurricane. This wood part of the school just, just collapsed like a house of cards. Now I want to show you a couple of interesting before and after views. Uh, so this is the view from the window where I was shooting from. This is right before the eye wall arrived. Now the little black Honda to the left of the tree, that's actually my car, okay? And notice there's like a truck next to it. And this is right as we were entering the eye, you could see the truck next to my car is gone. It just blew away, it kind of ended up on the other side of the parking lot. Interestingly, my car just stayed. It didn't even have a scratch. And it shows you that hurricane, violent hurricane uh, eye wall winds have the kind of erratic localized nature of uh, tornadoes. It's like the, the damage can be very streaky and weird. It's not it's not uniform even over small areas. And here's another before and after. Again, this is the view from the window. This is during the eye wall. So notice on the right, there's a there's a tree, a felled tree. Uh, and now look at that same tree during the eye. This is right after the inner eye wall when we're in the eye. And notice, oh, wow, okay, it's from a different angle. But now there's a car on top of that tree. I don't know where that car came from, which direction. I, I, I literally don't know where it came from. It's just once the eye arrived, once that cloak of whiteness disappeared, there was like a car sitting on top of that tree. Don't know which direction it came from. This is the front of the building. I told you uh, earlier on to remember that shot, all those lush green trees, and that's what it looked like afterward. These trees are actually designed by nature to just let go of their leaves, and that's actually how they survived. They were able to withstand the wind because they just let go of all the resistance. All those leaves just flew right off. But it doesn't look like a subtropical island anymore. It looks like we're in uh, Siberia in the middle of the winter. All right, so uh, I measured, as I said, 913.4 millibars in the eye. It was by far the lowest thing I ever recorded. Now, you guys saw my pressure trace, and you saw how it went down, but there's no recovery. It doesn't come back up. I don't have a hurricane V. I just have like what looks like half of a V. And you guys are probably wondering, okay, why? What happened to the rest of the data? Well, the building was badly damaged, and uh, after talking with my roommates, uh, the, the people that I rode out this, the front half of the storm with in that room, we decided that we needed to relocate to another uh, building in order to survive. And uh, once you relocate, you can't keep collecting data. The data wouldn't have integrity. You know, you have to keep the instruments in a controlled environment. So I had to make the hard choice. I really couldn't decide if I wanted to just stay there and risk it and keep collecting data or leave and find safety and actually honestly one of the one of the factors that influenced me was just that out of the 11 of us only that we only had three cars that were still functioning that weren't destroyed one of them was mine and uh, i felt some responsibility you know three other people needed a ride in my car to get to safety and i just uh, i decided that maybe that was a little more important than science so i stopped recording at that point it's possible my lowest pressure would have been lower if i'd kept recording who knows um you know i just try not to <laughs> let that gnaw away at me uh but you know when i look at when i look at my pressure graph the way it looks it looks like the, the pressure is starting to edge 
up again. So there's a good chance that that 913 was actually a real minimum. All right, so I said we had to relocate. And here's a map of this part of the island. A is where we were, is that school, and B is where we, uh, and B is where we ended up. And that distance is only about two thirds of a mile. It's not far at all. Sorry, I was just closing a window because a nearby gardener is making sounds with that leaf blower thing. Okay, so it was only two thirds of a mile, but it was one of the longest, it felt like one of the longest drives ever. Now remember at this point, I had no communication with the outside world, no nothing, no radar. I had no idea when the backside was gonna hit. And if we were stuck out on the road, in, in in those winds, we'd be dead. So it was a scary drive. Of course, the highway was littered with debris and we were having, you know, I was having to drive onto the grass and all kinds of crazy stuff. But eventually we did make it to the Bahamas government complex. And here's the inner courtyard. Now, the Bahamians really know how to build for hurricanes, and this, this building is up to their code. And look at that roof. That roof, <laughs> there's not a piece missing. They know how to build for these things. There's a lot of cosmetic damage. Those fancy-looking columns all got torn off because they were just junk, but the actual structure is very solid. Now, the interesting thing, and I, I wasn't filming during this time because I was driving and then I was lugging stuff, but when we got to this building, this is the biggest building on the island, and, and we were in the eye, and it was like people from every direction were running toward this building and driving toward it. It was like this mecca. People whose houses had collapsed, people who had swam to safety from the storm surge, everyone like was just like us with like these desperate rats. We were all just trying to get inside this building before the backside hit, and hundreds of people packed into this building before the backside of the cyclone hit. And then we got in it, and this was a safe building. And this building also had impact glass, meaning that you don't need to board up the windows. You actually, the glass doesn't break even if it's stricken by flying debris. So actually, in this part of the storm, I was able to actually watch outside of a window for a part of it. And I'll just give you a small taste of what the backside was like. Just a quick clip here. <laughs> So that gave you a little taste of that. So by around 4 p.m., the storm, the worst of it, the core of the hurricane had passed. And uh, for victims, the, the misery was just beginning. So you guys remember, a lot of you I know were tracking this at home, um, but one thing that everyone noticed was how the system really slowed down. And as the core of the hurricane went onto the neighboring island, onto Grand Bahama Island, it basically just stopped moving. And for us on Great Abaco, what that meant was we were stuck in a strong tropical storm for two days, okay? So after this hurricane passed, and you got all these people that are victims of this horrible storm, they've lost everything, they've lost homes, some of them have lost loved ones, all they have is the clothes on their back, hundreds of them crammed into this building that doesn't have plumbing, um, food is limited, there isn't electricity, the medical clinic is totally overwhelmed, and and it's days of like torrential rain and tropical storm force winds. I mean, it was like salt on the wound for these people. It was really, it was heartbreaking. It was really bad. Me, I, um, I was of course incommunicado for a couple of days. And I, you know, I remember when I, I didn't realize how like the Twitterverse was freaking out about this and I was, you know, presumed dead and all these other horrible things. But uh, during that time when everyone thought I was dead, I was uh, living in my car. I didn't want to take up space in the, uh, in the government building. Like I said, rule number one, when you're chasing is try not to be a burden. So I was living in my car, uh, which actually was nice. I was able to control my space, keep it clean. Uh, and I just kind of rationed my food. I, I had a certain amount of calories that I was allowed. I allowed myself to eat per day just so I could last a long time if I had to. And uh, eventually, I finally got off the island a few days later via helicopter. So now I want to show you the aftermath and, uh, you know, some of the things that we can learn from it. All right. So the damage across Marsh Harbor, this town of about 6,000 people, uh, not surprisingly, was 
catastrophic. So the storm surge was tremendous, and I didn't I didn't get a chance to actually do any um, careful measurements, but it was clearly very very high. The water marks on buildings were extremely high. It was obviously well over twenty feet, and it just swept the low lying areas with just devastating force. The commercial promenade where all the restaurants and stuff were was just like reduced to rubble, and the poorer neighborhoods like the uh, these neighborhoods called the mud and the pigeon peas, which I'm going to talk about more in a second. They were just some neighborhoods were completely swept away, like you couldn't even find where the streets were. Neighborhoods, some of the more affluent neighborhoods that were above the water, that were in hills, were just, they had ex extreme wind damage, like almost every house was just badly damaged and cars were smashed and mutilated, thrown around like toys. And one thing I did notice, construction quality mattered. You could really see certain houses, and I'll show you some examples, some houses did really well, even in a direct hit from a 169 hurricane. Clearly, some of these houses were put together very well. Like I said, the Bahamians, they really know how to build for hurricanes. They've got strict codes on these islands, and anything that's up to code performs well, even in a Category 5. So let's take a look. Um, first of all, as I showed you before, lots of crazy car damage. Like, like, look at that hood. Like, what happened to that thing? Like, why did it get that way? Why is it like, it got like desurfaced, but the, it's just just weird man it's like, like that's an extreme wind that would do stuff like that uh the bahamian uh, the bahamas government complex is in the background look how look at that building it looks almost untouched look at that roof that's some good construction there um, I had my car was still working. So while I was stuck there, I was able to be helpful. Um, like I took one, an injured guy to a medical clinic and I took this fellow and his wife to their house to get their stuff. This is from the more affluent suburban part of the town called the Central Pines region, but their house was made of wood and, and it unfortunately, uh, it, it couldn't withstand those winds. Now his wife could not find her car. It wasn't where she parked it. She was like, I don't know where it went. And we eventually found it. It had blown across the street, down a hill and into a forest. Like we just, we eventually found it but it was so far that we she almost missed it uh this is another part of that neighborhood now look at that that car just thrown around like a toy wedge between a couple of other cars but look at the houses behind it they look pretty good huh look at those roofs those houses are well constructed those little they're like little concrete bunkers and those roofs are really well fastened that they withstood that even though the cars were thrown around like toys and those are not small cars Here's other houses that, um, again, these look to be pretty well-constructed houses. There's damage to them, but they, they, they withstood the winds well enough to protect the occupants. So I would say these, these houses, although they look beat up, when you consider what they went through, these, are, these, did, these performed pretty well. Uh, this one did not. This clearly wasn't up to code, and it's just a pile of rubble. It looks like a tornado hit it. Now, here's another one where I guess the roof was not, uh, was not up to the Baham Bahamian standards there, and uh, unfortunately... Just uh, most of it came off. And uh, here's one where the second story obviously took a beating because the winds were a little higher as you go up. This is uh, now it's like storm surge damage. This is the, uh, the sort of main business district or what was the main business district of Marsh Harbor where there's hotels and restaurants. And you can see it's just all rubble. The one, two punch of the storm surge and the wind made quick work of that. And uh, yeah, that water was like a bulldozer. It just knocked over even these sort of concrete block structures couldn't withstand it. Now I want to show you some really interesting aerials, some befores and afters. Uh, so this is a uh, Marsh Harbor, like basically the entire town. And you can see my two locations are labeled. Location A is that's that's the school where I did most of the filming of the front, front part of the hurricane. And location B is the government complex. You can see they're not so far apart. So that's before the hurricane. And that's after. And of course, one thing you notice is that everything's brown because all the uh, all the uh, vegetation was killed, and you can also see like all the all the wreckage and destruction. And we can zoom in closer so you can see a little better. Okay, so this is the more western part of the town. So the the left part that looks sort of like a very suburban, like kind of planned subdivision. That's the Central Pines region that I was telling you about. This is a more affluent area of town, and you can see on the right is the school where I wrote out the hurricane. Uh, you can actually the the of that little complex, the lower left building is the one that I was in. You can see it facing the parking lot. So this is before the hurricane, and this is after. And you can see all the damage to the houses, or I, hopefully you can in the resolution that you're seeing this at, but you can just see every house has, like, major damage and is missing roofs, and again, everything's brown. And let's look at another part of town. Okay, so this view shows you in the lower left is the Bahamas government complex, that big kind of square-looking building with a big courtyard. And then uh, right kind of in the central upper part of the image, you can see a neighborhood that's, um, it looks very dense. There's a lot of, like, twisty roads and 
little tiny buildings. That's called the mud and the pigeon pea. This is a very low lying area. Uh, it's also a poorer neighborhood, and it tends to be where a lot of undocumented Haitian immigrants live. Uh, and the, apparently they tried to evacuate this area, but but because a lot of the immigrants there are undocumented, they were maybe scared to, to listen to government orders, and a lot of people decided to stay, which was very unfortunate because this was where the most catastrophic damage happened. So this is before... And this is after, and I'm going to toggle back and forth. So look at the mud and the pigeon pea. Look at that area. Again, it's kind of like that, that, that sort of central knot of twisty roads and small buildings very close together. You can see it's literally just swept away. It's bulldozed. It's gone. And I'm going to show you some uh, ground-level views of that now. This is what the mud and pigeon pea look like from the ground level okay and remember this was this was a neighborhood this was like there were there were houses and there were there were like two-story buildings there were shops there were streets there's nothing now it's just like it's just literally a field of rubble you could see one what looks like a bar or tavern standing in the distance but there's just like nothing there i mean that's i mean it's just it was out of all the years i've chased hurricanes the only other storm where i saw destruction like this was uh was Super Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines that even came close to this, like the completeness of this destruction. And what the picture doesn't capture was that you you could smell the death. Uh, you know, there were there were there were bodies under this wreckage, and we'll never know how many people died in this storm because a lot of the people who died were not they weren't uh, documented residents. And uh, so I I'm sure that the official death toll is is uh, an undercount. I talked to a lot of people, a lot of residents from this area, people who lived here. Um, a lot of the, the, the Haitians speak a little English, most of them. So it's not their main language, but they speak enough that we were able to communicate. And I was able to ask them what they experienced, what happened. Um, and some of the people that I met at the go government complex tried to write out the storm in this neighborhood and actually had to swim to safety to get to that government complex because, you know, this is what happened there. But some of them, I talked to some people who actually saw their loved ones swept away. I mean, horrible stories that just like you couldn't believe every person I talked to had an epic tale of how they escaped. It was the most unbelievable thing. And I want to show you, um, here's just a video, just because I feel like video that pans around kind of captures the scale of the destruction a little more completely. So here we go. Yeah, you know, when I look at that clip, it just reminds me that there is there's really nothing like the destructive force of a of a of a top end hurricane, you know, just like it just looks like a nuclear bomb was dropped on that place. And it really it, it's really awe inspiring. You know, it just reminds me of just the, the just the incredible power of these things. It's amazing that this that 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 hurricane like a hurricane like Dorian, think about it. It's not some evil thing sent by a God that wants to punish us. It's just it, this is just the, the earth doing its thing. It's a natural process. It's warm air, um, you know, starting to spin around. And it's just it's incredible that that happens. Uh, the human impact of this thing, you can't even get your head around it. Uh, the, the sort of emotional uh, impact of this for residents who lived in this idyllic, beautiful place. And uh, the recovery is going to take a long time. This is not a year. This is not two years. This is not five years. I think, honestly, I think Marsh Harbor, we're talking like a generation before this place gets back to normal. Uh, I keep in touch. One of the families that was in that room with me, I've kept in touch with. I talked to them a lot. And their life has been an odyssey since this. They spent a few months living in Florida as refugees. Then they were living on another Bahamian island. Now they're back in their house, which is basically destroyed. But the shell is there, and they're trying to rebuild it. And uh um, life is nothing like normal in Marsh Harbor. They, uh, you know, it's the hurricane was what, like nine months ago almost. And, uh, you know, they, they still don't have like electricity and basic, like, you know, plumbing in, in most of these places, let alone 
you know, restaurants and things like that. I mean, it, it is the infrastructure was destroyed and it's gonna it's gonna be a long, slow slog for them to get back to normal. So I hope you found that presentation interesting. Um, if you want to follow me on social media, if you don't already, on Twitter and Facebook, I'm at iCyclone. On Instagram, it's iCyclone1 because some kid in the United Arab Emirates took iCyclone and, and Instagram won't help me with it. <laughs> so uh, so there we go. So um, I'd be happy to answer questions if anyone has any. Josh, fascinating presentation as always. Really appreciate the energy and and and. You know, put yourself out there for this. We appreciate that. Um, go ahead and unshare your screen so we can see when you answer. Um, let's start with um, uh, Nick Morcanelli's question. He says, why were the residents not in the government building the whole time? They had plenty of warning that this was not a storm to ride out. Why did they stay at home for that first half of the storm and not get to that government building, you think? Okay, so I've noticed in the Philippines also, so, so people in the Philippines, they know they know hurricanes, or they call them typhoons, but they're hurricanes. They know hurricanes better than anyone. People in the Philippines have been in the absolute worst. A lot of these people have been in like category fours, multiple ones. And I think the Bahamas is the same way. And with that knowledge and with that experience comes a certain degree of, um, it almost backfires. It's like, yes, they know the destructive intensity of these things, but they've also been in them before. And they and they they have, a, I think, almost like a confidence, like, okay, this is a hurricane. And this is going to be a bad one, but we've been in bad hurricanes. And I think it's hard for anybody to, uh, you know, to, to get their mind around the idea of like, okay, this is going to be a once in 200 year event. And that's completely beyond anything else. Another thing I want to say is that a lot of people did, you know, did get into, you know, safe buildings like the school, which was presumed to be safe where hundreds of people were. No one expected that to blow apart. And another thing I want to say is that the Bahamians you know, they built houses really good there. I mean, I mean, houses mostly perform very well there, even in very severe hurricanes. So if they're above the storm surge line, it really often makes sense for Bahamians to ride out the storm at home. And like I said, the area, the mud and the pigeon pea, that area that was wiped out, as I mentioned before, I think that there were some uh, sociological reasons why evacuations didn't happen there because those were undocumented residents who were maybe uh, didn't want to reveal themselves to government officials because they were worried. So, so there were there were complex things going on there. Rich Johnson's asking after this experience with Dorian, do you envision yourself not going to the storms much longer because of the advanced instrumentation, the remote sensing cameras, and everything else that's that's being put the being put in the, the front of the storms now do you think you're going to keep chasing after this experience absolutely you know first of all chasing is in my blood and i'm always going to do it and you know there the the data collection is is a very big part of it for me uh and and i and it's going to continue to be relevant because even with recon even with remote sensing even with all that stuff there is nothing as good as just taking an old-fashioned barometer and getting in the eye at the surface there is nothing there is still nothing as good as that you know nothing from from satellite uh data not yet at least okay and even with um even with recon for example hurricane patricia and the pacific coast they had recon planes going into this you know up, uh, going into it up until near landfall but they didn't have one in it at landfall but i was there at landfall in the eye so we had a good idea of what the landfall intensity was and everything else aside even if my data became totally irrelevant which they want in my lifetime I still just want the experience, you know, I still, there is that side of me that is still just, you know, uh, I don't want to say enraptured by these things, but I, I, I continue to be fascinated by them every time. Marcel Ligabo says he read in a paper that 47% of Floridians won't leave in case of a hurricane. In your opinion, how much will the virus affect, uh, how much effect will the virus have in a major hurricane? It's a great question, and it's the one that's on everyone's mind. And it's, of course, outside of my area of expertise. That's an emergency management question, and I mean, I'm just a dumb hunting dog. You know? But, uh, but I, I will say this: I am not, I do not envy emergency managers in our hurricane country. When I think of the emergency managers from Texas, to Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, up Georgia, and the Carolinas, I, I really, I just feel for all of them because if a major hurricane does approach and they have to do evacuations, think about it. Evacuation centers are all about cramming people into rooms in tight quarters. How are we going to do this? It's going to be complicated, and I think there's going to have to be rules around it. But like I said, I'm not going to express opinions because it's really, I, I consider that an area of expertise, and it's not mine. You've been through a lot of storms, obviously. Your 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 eye penetrations are very significant. So you've seen places that have been through a hurricane, and now it's years later since then. How long does it take a place to really get back to 
to full operation. You know, March Harbor is going to be a generation, like you said. But but some of these places have been hit before. Have you seen what the what the time is? How long does it take? Yeah, you know, it really it, it it depends on the level of impact. So so one of the places that I followed most closely was um, the Taklaban City in Super Typhoon Haiyan. So Haiyan was actually a tiny bit stronger than Dorian, although I didn't get in the eye. But the the right eye wall just passed right over the city. There was a devastating storm surge. Thousands of people died in the city. And this was, by the way, Marsh Harbor was 6,000 people. This is a small town. Tacloban City is 220,000. So this is like a pretty big city that took a direct hit from a big Category 5. So the city was devastated, just like, I mean, looked like just like apocalyptic. And then I went back three months later, and then I went back on the year anniversary because I, I kind of developed a relationship with the people there. I have all kinds of friends there now, and I, I feel an emotional connection to the place. And so I was able to see the rebirth. And it was amazing. Even after three months, it was it was like the, the, how, how fast the normalcy came back really impressed me that there were parts of the town where you almost feel like it, it, nothing had happened. And a year later, it was in really good shape. And even the, some of the towns that had, some of the neighborhoods that had been totally wiped out were coming back. Now, what Tacloban City had going for it was that it was a pretty big city with it just it has like a critical mass that and, and it had enough buildings that withstood the storm. There was like a core of the city there still. Marsh Harbor is only 6,000 people, and I think that the proportion of destruction to the size of the town was much greater. And I think that Marsh Harbor, I, I think that it's unlike Tacloban City, I, I, I think that the road to recovery, I literally think is going to be, like we're talking a decade, I think it's going to be like that. Uh, one last example I want to bring up is Hurricane Harvey. So I wrote out Hurricane Harvey, a Category 4 in Rockport, Texas, a small town that took a direct hit, went right through the eye. They got hammered really bad. They were devastated. I went back on um, like 10 months later for the start of hurricane season. The mayor invited me to, to, to sort of make a speech um, and, and they were bouncing back. I mean, I, I came back and I just remember you, you step into the town and all you hear is hammering and bzz, saws going. I mean, it, it was really heartwarming. It was like, wow, man, this place is almost like having a boom. It was just, it was coming back. And I felt like that was really cool. But uh, yeah, each town is different. It depends on the impact, the size of the size of the, uh, population center and other things. Bill, I know you're stomping a little bit to get in here. Bill Reed's got some great questions, I know. So, Bill, what do you, what's on your mind with this? This is fascinating. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Dog was barking. I had to stay muted there for a minute. <laughs> uh, when you when you went to the Bahamas uh, uh, and chose that location, uh, how did you determine that you were in a safe spot relative to the surge? Um, you know, it was, I estimated, but it was, it was a visual estimation. So the Bahamas are mostly very flat, but the, the Abaco, Great Abaco actually has like, not, not hills, like, not like the kind that we have in California, you know, like LA and San Francisco have crazy hills. It doesn't have that kind of hills, but it has some rolling hills and just driving around the, uh, the town, uh, like around four or 5 AM, you know, you could see the slope, the slope of the hills and, and that school, you could see it was kind of on the crest of a gentle hill. And I knew I was confident it would be okay. I had, um, with my pressure altimeters, I estimated, I think, um, I think I estimated a, an elevation of around 33 feet and I felt like we would be safe and we were. Good. Very good. Now, I assume you buy the extra insurance when renting a car. I'm surprised they don't have a uh, like a hot checklist. Uh, don't rent a car to this guy when a hurricane's coming with your reputation, because I'm sure the cars get damaged. No, I, you know, actually, uh, the number one priority for me is to, is to is to protect the car. And what's interesting is the car that I rented uh, with this storm actually fared better because it was with me. So I had the ground, I had the car on high ground. And actually barely had a scratch and I actually returned it in really good condition. Well, I didn't return it. I left it where it was and then went to Nassau Island to give the owner the keys. But um, but that car actually was one of the few in their fleet that I think survived because all the ones where they stored them down near the airport, I think they all flooded. Yeah, I'm, I'm really surprised you didn't get a big piece of debris slam into it. That was fortunate. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I try to, you know, I always try to predict where, you know, like, um, I mean, ideally, like in Hurricane Irma, for example, in Florida, um, about uh, six hours before the hurricane struck, I actually parked, I parked the car in an elevated medical center 
uh, parking structure, just got rid of the car, just just stowed it in a safe place until after the hurricane, uh, because you know all of Naples was supposed to go underwater. So that's usually what I like to do before before the hurricane really hits. Is basically just store the car, just put it somewhere safe, somewhere high, and somewhere sheltered. Um, when I can't do that, and I try to put it really close to a building, but I always try to make sure that it's in a place that's safer than where it would have been otherwise. Very good. Uh, do you ever have nightmares or PTSD-like symptoms after one of these events? It's a really good question. So Super Typhoon Haiyan was, uh, in terms of like, human impact was the worst I've been in. Uh, it was as bad as Dorian, but but it hit a larger city and there were thousands of deaths. And I saw things that I'd never seen before. I saw like dead bodies in the street and just stuff like that, which I, I'd never seen stuff like that before. I, um, you know, we went by the medical clinic and I just saw all kinds of people, including children with like traumatic injuries, just like horrible things. And, and Haiyan was the one that, that most kind of rattled me. And I remember, you know, I was stuck there for a few days and, you know, I'm kind of a good survivor. And I remember just telling, I kind of, sh I remember I'm good at compartmentalizing. I remember just telling myself, just, I shut my emotions off. I just literally like, you know, I rescued people during the storm because I thought people in my hotel were going to die. And I jumped in the water to rescue people. But after the storm, I just shut down my emotions and I'm just like, all right, I have to focus on survival and how to, how to get home. And I'm not going to feel any emotions. I'm just going to like, like, it was like a way to survive. After I got back to LA and after I was home, that's when I felt all the emotions. Oh, I was like crying and all kinds of stuff. And I didn't want to chase for a long time after that. Mm -hmm. um, but then I eventually, you know, there's just that itch that I have, you know, it's in my blood to go chasing. But, but Hyann was the one that really, um, I, I, I kind of, it took me a while to kind of get over that one. One way that helped me, well, not to go on about it, but one way was to be involved with the recovery. So I started working with the Filipino community. Um, you know, I, I got involved with a big fundraiser. I was a featured speaker and just doing stuff like that to raise awareness. That was like actually very therapeutic just to be helpful. And then I'm um, going back and you know, I went back three months later to see how the people were who I'd become friends with. And then I went back on the one year anniversary, which for me was a really deep experience too, to be there and celebrate the one year anniversary of this event. And those things, you know, it's like they, you know, they, they give you, uh, a sense of meaning and closure with it. That's very, uh, very good. Uh, very good of you. Uh, 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 your survival kit, do you, uh, do you uh, purchase it when you get there or do, or do you take stuff with you as far as food and water and things like that? I usually just, um, I, I always try to travel real light. So I usually get my supplies when I arrive. And um, the thing, when I chase, I am not hungry. You know, I, it's like, I, I literally feel like I'm a hunting dog. Like as soon as the computer models, as soon as I'm starting to think I might be chasing something, when the computer models are starting to converge on a hurricane landfall, I'm like, okay, I'm going to be chasing on five days. I notice it's like a slow adrenaline drip starts and I start losing my appetite. And like, so over a week I start eating less and less and I start sleeping less and less because I'm checking like the computer models every three, like six hours. But, um, by the time I, I get to where I'm going, I'm not really that hungry, so I kind of have to force myself to eat. So I usually just like get some really simple food, just basically uh, just stuff that'll supply me with calories, like nuts and crackers, and of course, a lot of water. Water's the most important thing. And I just kind of survive on that. I do not eat well uh, during hurricanes. The interesting thing is as soon as the hurricane passes and as soon as the chase is over, two things that I do, one is like I just sleep like I was like, like I, like like I was a rock star partying for a week. I sleep like crazy. It's like getting over flu almost, and I eat like crazy. It's like I make up for the whole week of not eating. They're very interesting. That's a many of us that work operationally that worked hurricanes have that exact same thing. You, the adrenaline stifles the urge to eat and sleep, and then when the storm's over, you have to recoup it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Uh, uh, just to reiterate one point you made to a question about evacuation of the people there, the, they probably do follow the run from the water, hide from the wind, and they and quite rightly should because there's probably not enough large structures to shelter even all the people they needed to potentially could have had moving in from the water. But the chaser motto should be run towards the water and seek out the wind. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I would say that's pretty accurate. <laughs> We've got a couple more questions from Lou Fincher I want to pass on to you because Lou, uh, a great follower of what, what you do and what we're doing here. He asked, A, what tools do you pack? And then explain how 
you're different from other chasers in your goals. You've talked a little bit about that, but maybe touch a little more on that. So in terms of tools, I, I'm always, I feel like I always disappoint with this question because I don't have like, I, you know, I'm not like super equipment intensive. Uh, and I try to keep things really light because I'm, I'm going around the globe and I'm, I'm often like hopping from one flight to another. So I have to keep everything in carry ons. I got to keep it simple. So the number one thing is I, um, I use Kestrel weather meters because they're, they're, they're small and they're also accurate. So, so the two things that are important to me are portability and accuracy. They're accurate to within like about a millibar. And I travel with four or five of them. So what I do is I like to either plant them at different places or at least have two with me at my location collecting data so I have redundancy. And like in Dorian, for example, I had that 913.4 millibars. I had another device right next to it that was 913.7. So that's really good corroboration. That tells me that, okay, these data are, are accurate. So yeah, so I have like a bunch of Kestrels and then I have um, a few small cameras. And lately I've been... A big puzzle for hurricane chasers is how to how to film what kinds of devices to use. Every time I get a nice expensive camera, it just it can't withstand those conditions. It's really frustrating. So I've started my my, my recent combo is a, a GoPro and and a Samsung phone because both of those tools are the, both of those cameras are really water resistant, and I find that I could really I could shoot in really rough conditions with those two things. So that's what I've been doing lately. It's a combination of GoPro and my Samsung, uh, and then my iPad is actually my main source of information. It's just everything right in my hand. I, I, I like it better than my phone in terms of looking at radar and stuff like that. But those are um, those are my main things. Obviously, I have like, you know, flashlights and other like small gadgetry, but nothing that's like too interesting. But those are, I would say, like my main things. And I think there's another part to that question. But yeah, yeah. with how you're different from other chasers and your goals. Oh, um, well, I would say the, the thing that makes me most unique is how very, very narrowly specialized I am. You know, I, like, I'm like a weirdo. Okay, I'm really into hurricanes and anything else. I'm just kind of like, yeah, whatever. Like people start asking questions about snow or, you know, dew points. And I'm like, I don't know. Like I'm really, I'm all about hurricanes. And that's been my obsession since I was like a kid. And I'm just, I'm all about the hurricane, you know? And I think um, it's just my extremely narrow specialization. And it's how I am in life. I believe in like, I'm not the type who wants to be jack of all trades. I'm the type that wants to be the best at one very specific thing and just sledgehammer it. And for me, it's hurricanes, hunting down hurricane cores. And in terms of how I compare to other hurricane chasers, you know, it's just, I guess, my global reach that I'm willing to just go anywhere, including to, you know, difficult uh, to reach places in developing countries, sometimes places that aren't safe for political reasons. You know, it's like, I, I go for it. And it's really weird because... In other parts of life, I'm a total pussycat. You know, I'm just this guy who lives in LA. I'm a health nut. I eat really healthy. I like to stay on my routine. I'm like a homebody. It's like nothing about me would suggest that I've got this kind of rabid, really dangerous interest in, you know, flying to the other side of the earth to some weird place I've never been to be in like category five wins. But hey, <laughs> it's the screw that's loose. <laughs> This is the last question. I'll have them, Bill. Maybe you you have a wrap up question as well. But how's this year going to be different for you? Oh yeah, good question. Really good questions. I have a plan. Uh, so the, the pandemic obviously has changed life for everybody. You know, it's just we're all having to adjust just how how we do things. So it looks like East Asia is is not going to be in play. You know, a lot of those countries like Japan, Taiwan, and the Philippines are the three uh, nations or territories I should say that I go to, and uh, they're either closed off to outsiders or you, if you arrive, for example, in Taiwan, you have to do a 14 day quarantine. So that means that that's I'm expecting that East Asia. I don't think that's going to improve in the next few months so i basically ruled it out and people always ask me well god that's weird you're, you're into hurricanes and you live in la what a stupid place to live not for me if i'm hunting in east asia in australia in the united states in the caribbean actually la is the perfect headquarters because i'm a non-stop flight to everywhere but since i'm not going to east asia this year i want to be more central and so Enter Hurricane House. Okay, so uh, since it looks like I'm going to be stuck in the United States, and maybe I might be able to get to Mexico, hopefully I can, but since I'm going to be very U.S.-centric this year, I am going to be living in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, starting in July. And I'm renting a house. Like I said, I'm calling it Hurricane House. That was my mom's idea. And uh, I'm going I'm to be there right after starting July 4th weekend. And the reason is because when I looked at it, I don't want to have to deal with flights this year. Just I don't want to deal with it. Just flight itineraries are messed up. They're expensive. You know, who knows if it's safe. 
from Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, South Texas, like South Padre Island, South Florida, and the Eastern Carolinas, which is the zone I want to cover. Everything is basically within a 12-hour drive. So it's going to be, I'm going to be living in Mississippi, and I'm going to be road tripping to every storm. And the final way it's going to be different, I'm a little bit of a snob. I'm like kind of picky about what I go after. And this year, I'm not going to be so picky. I'm probably going to go after every every piece of crap, just because I'm going to be down there. (laughs) (laughs) Very good. Bill, any final thoughts before we wrap this up? Uh, Well, uh, as much as I'd like to see you, I hope I don't see you this summer over in League City, Texas. Well, I don't take that personally. I, uh, I I know you don't mean it to be unkind, so that's okay. Maybe we could have lunch or something. Yeah. Yeah, don't, I'm just not ready to test out the building code on my house, even though I think it's pretty good. <laughs> Fair enough. Excellent talk. Thank you very much. I'm glad everyone enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Josh. And I, I echo Bill's sentiments. We love you, but South Padre is off limits to you this year. We we, we don't want to we don't want to see you anywhere nearby. <laughs> great, great job. Great job, Josh. Thank you. Fascinating program. We appreciate it. You're always with us at the National Tropical Weather Conference. We hope to see you in person in uh, 2021 uh, back on South Padre to do this presentation. And hopefully you won't have chased anything this year. We hope we get to talk about Dorian some more because it's been a quiet year for the U.S. Gulf Coast. Hey, what am I going to do? I need something to present about. Don't say that. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Thanks. Alex, back to you in San Antonio. All righty. Here we are back. Uh, And of course, I want to remind everyone tomorrow is another big day for us. We've got Dr. Phil Klotz back at 10 o'clock Central Daylight Time tomorrow. He's going to be updating his 2020 hurricane seasonal forecast so that's going to be the big thing that we're going to be watching next week we've got two more programs coming your way dr hal needham is going to be talking about his usage project coastal flooding and then dr joseph sioni boy he's he's the guy with flying these these small little things are called the uas's into hurricanes and gathering data two great programs coming up all the way up there until June 17th. So please be sure and join us. Thanks so much for joining us today. Don't forget, you can watch the replay here. We'll share it with you a little bit later. Another thanks to Josh for joining us. And, of course, our big thanks to all our sponsors who kind of make it happen, USAA, South Padre Island, Convention and Bureau's Bureau, and, of course, Flylocks. <laughs>